Eu sou Eduardo Lopes e estou no primeiro ano de Licenciatura de Engenharia Física Tecnológica. Sou o Tiago Jorge e estou no terceiro ano de Engenharia Física aqui no Técnico. O meu nome é Tomás, estou no primeiro ano de mestrado em Engenharia Física e Tecnológica aqui no Técnico. My name is David Hilditch. I'm prof here in Centra within Technico. I'm working on numerical and mathematical relativity. Pelo que eu sei, um buraco negro é um objeto físico cuja massa é tão elevada que esta é a frase quase clichê que nem a luz consegue escapar. É essencialmente uma zona no espaço onde uh, o efeito gravítico uh, é tão grande que é suficientemente grande para que nada à volta do buraco negro consiga escapar nem mesmo a luz. There are several different ways that we could try and um, tackle that question. One way is to think of, of the notion of uh, if we've got, if we've got um, a compact object or if we've got you know like the like the Earth, right? Okay, that's not very compact, but we can think of that, and we can consider what is the escape velocity on Earth. Right, and then we could consider having more and more compact objects and then obviously the escape velocity for said object will increase. The notion of a black hole is like the limiting case of that from which nothing can escape, not even light. Once the escape velocity of an object becomes, uh, becomes the speed of light, then you know that, okay, nothing can get out because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Resulta normalmente do colapso de uma estrela, quando o, o núcleo tem uma massa tão grande que colapsa sobre ela própria. Se houver um limite superior àquilo que seria esperado para formar uma estrela de neutrões, ele acaba por colapsar ainda mais e forma um buraco negro. Os buracos negros são formados quando uma estrela supermassiva, no final das suas vidas, colapsam gravitacionalmente. Ou seja, quando a pressão não consegue equilibrar a, a pressão da gravidade e, portanto, há um colapso gravitacional e a estrela acaba por concentrar-se num ponto muito pequeno de densidade infinita, obviamente não é infinita, mas é muito grande, e portanto forma-se aí o buraco negro. As stars, they, they burn all of their fuel, right, and then they can no longer support themselves against the attraction of, of, uh, of gravity, and so then uh, the star eventually will collapse, and if the star is big enough, then um, it will have enough mass so that when it, when it collapses and the compactness of the object becomes so high that a black hole forms. In the case of our sun, that will not happen, but for, for much larger stars, then that, that's, the, that's the canonical thing that happens. Há milhões, de certeza, ou mais. O centro da nossa galáxia é um buraco negro. Aliás, na maior parte das galáxias, o que se encontra no centro é sempre um buraco negro, quase, mas nem sempre. The main two types of black holes that we think about would be stellar mass objects. So that means things which are like roughly the same mass as, as the sun or, you know, 10 times or 100 times that, something like that. And then there's another population of black holes, which are the, which are the, the supermassive black holes. They live at the center of basically every galaxy that we, that we look at. Looking at how stars behave very close to the center of galaxies, that's one way that we can tell that that there are very, very compact objects there. So we, just, we look at the motion and it seems that they're orbiting around something which we can't see. That gives us strong evidence that there's actually um, a very compact object in the center of, of galaxies and we can calculate the mass by looking at the uh, trajectories of the stars. Não sei, devem ser tipo milhares, milhões. Nem sei como é que se estimaria uma coisa dessas. I guess you could estimate the number by trying to figure out, okay, how many stars are there? How old is the universe? How many large enough stars should have collapsed to form black holes, but those calculations, I imagine, are very, very complicated and they must have huge uncertainties in them. Eu diria, se calhar, porque, se calhar, a nossa própria existência deve-se ao facto de não estarmos perto o suficiente de um para, para sermos sugados. Não vamos ser sugados por buracos negros, tal como não somos sugados pelo Sol. Nós sentimos a atração gravítica do Sol, mas não somos uh, atraídos pelo Sol, ok? Os buracos negros, eles, eles são previstos pela teoria da relatividade de Einstein, que diz que as massas geram deformações no, no espaço-tempo, não é? Quando temos massas suficientemente grandes num espaço suficientemente pequeno, ou seja, um corpo de densidade suficientemente elevada, isso vai gerar um, um buraco negro. Uma das soluções da equação de Einstein uh, prevê uma singularidade nesse espaço-tempo, ou seja, um ponto onde, onde as coisas divergem, tipo, onde algum parâmetro vai para o infinito, e o efeito do buraco negro 
só acontece numa singularidade que é delimitada pelo evento horizonte, penso eu. Well, the first thing that they think about is if something's exploding, something is going to infinity. That is what happens, right? When we when we actually look at solutions, but historically in the first studies, the notion of singularity actually was very different to that. It was it was this notion instead of geodesic incompleteness. If you consider an observer that goes inside a black hole, and that observer is say just freely falling, and they and they keep an eye on their on their watch, that observer as they as they go forward in time, the world line of that observer, the path that they draw out in in the space time, that curve. Has finite length, so that means that somehow the curve that they go along, right, which is called a geodesic here, time-like geodesic, it has finite length. The bit where they're incomplete, that that's what people think of as as the, the singularity. And as we go towards the point at which those geodesics are incomplete, what stops the geodesic from from existing? What one sees, say, in, in numerical simulations or in or in, in mathematical work, is that something in the solutions gets very, very big, and so there's something that blows up, right, and that prevents the geodesic from being extended. Para ser sugado para um dentro de um buraco negro é preciso passar um, o horizonte uh, de eventos, que é definido pelo raio de Schwarzschild, em que a velocidade de escape é igual à velocidade da luz. É um raio bem definido, conseguimos descrevê-lo matematicamente, e quando se passa esse raio já não se consegue escapar. Eles também têm um limite de ação, assim como uma estrela normal tem um, um limite pelo qual consegue atrair as coisas e ter a objetos a orbitar, planetas no caso, também um buraco negro tem um limite de atração. You can orbit them perfectly well, but if you get close enough, then the orbits are no longer stable. You'd be able to orbit, but if there was any tiny perturbation to your orbit, then you would either fly out or fly in and do, you know, really wild orbits. And so if you're if you're close enough, then you can't orbit anymore. All you can do is fall in or do very very have some very very wild dynamics and then maybe fall into the black hole or shoot off to infinity. And in fact there's even a more interesting phenomena inside the ISCO which is called the, the light ring. You can shoot a ray of light and the light can actually orbit the black hole from outside. So it's not trapped as if it had actually fallen into the black hole but it can orbit the black hole. Tanto quanto sei se enquanto estão a Enquanto tem matéria a entrar, eles aumentam sempre um bocado de tamanho, mas ao longo do tempo vão emitindo, emitindo radiação, radiação de Hawking, e passados muitos, muitos, muitos anos, acabam por se evaporar. They do grow, and the crucial thing to know about them is that if you ignore quantum effects, they can't shrink, right? They can only grow. So they can stay the same size or they can grow. If there's a lot of matter around the black hole, then the matter could be falling into the black hole and that would make the, that would make the hole grow. Obviamente que sim. Um grande exemplo é a fusão de buracos negros. Acreditamos que haja fusão de buracos negros pela detecção de ondas gravitacionais. In these systems where we've got two black holes orbiting each other, when the two black holes merge, they turn into a single black hole, which is the size of roughly the size of both put together. Bem, eu suponho que sim. Sim, sim, tem temperatura e emitem radiação. É a radiação de Hawking. Acho que a ideia da radiação de Hawking consiste em, em ter um bocadinho também a teoria, a teoria quântica. Por exemplo, nós temos um, uma flutuação quântica a cada, a cada instante, forma-se uma partícula e uma antipartícula. Se isto acontecer no, no limite, na, na fronteira do horizonte de eventos, se uma, for, se uma, das, uma das partículas for sugada pelo buraco negro e a outra sair, estamos a ter a emissão de uma, de uma partícula. Get a particle and an antiparticle being created, and they would annihilate each other, and then everything's good. When there's a black hole present, what can happen is one of those two particles falls inside the black hole, and then the other one doesn't have to be annihilated. And so this is this famous calculation by Hawking. You can go through that calculation, and then you can find out that there's a kind of latent temperature associated with the black hole of those particles being created, and then some of them, some of them propagating out. Quanto menor a massa e quanto menor a energia, maior a temperatura. São um dos objetos mais estranhos nesse aspecto. Eu já soube fazer isso no exercício de termodinâmica, mas agora já não sei. Eu diria que, que o raio tem de ser inversamente proporcional à temperatura, mas não tenho a certeza. That temperature is inversely proportional to the mass of the, of the black hole. So bit for bigger black holes, the temperature is smaller. What it is, 
is the following. If you imagine that you had, say, a single black hole, but completely isolated just by itself, and then from all that I've told you before, you, know, you would think, well, okay, this thing can only grow. And if I've got a black hole, which is very, very big, then it means that uh, the temperature is very, very low. And if the temperature is very, very low, it means that it's radiating energy very, very slowly. And so that means that it's losing energy very slowly. So it means that it will evaporate very slowly. So there's this, this idea from, from that calculation that, okay, if, if, the, if the black hole is radiating in any sense, then the energy has to come from somewhere. And the only source of energy is the black hole itself, and therefore the black hole should slowly um, shrink. To all intents and purposes, astrophysical black holes don't evaporate. We have to sort of put aside really exciting theoretical calculation from what you know what is likely to be a good description of, of, the, of the universe and because the stellar mass black holes are so big the evaporation process isn't very efficient. We'd have to wait until much longer than the age of the universe to actually see stellar mass black holes um, evaporate. Talvez a questão de ser um buraco tenha a ver com o facto de ser uma singularidade ali um ponto onde as coisas Vão para o infinito. Pensava-se que não, que não havia emissão de luz, que não havia emissão de partículas. Parte do negro, sobretudo ao facto de absorver tudo e não emitir nada. Nada consegue escapar, nem mesmo a luz, e portanto, uh, de facto, o interior de um buraco negro é negro. Se virmos a imagem de que saiu do buraco negro, vamos perceber que ele não é assim tão negro, porque pronto, é a distorção do espaço-tempo e a luz toda que anda à volta daquilo, conseguimos ver a essência do buraco negro. Quando olhamos lá para fora, não vamos ver o buraco negro. All we can hope to do is infer the, their presence by looking at the behavior of other matter fields around the black hole, like stars, or maybe there's some kind of some kind of dust around the black hole that we can see, or a big accretion disk which is feeding the black hole. Lots of things. We're seeing these gravitational waves coming from binary black holes. From astrophysical arguments, we have an idea, right, of how we could form black holes of roughly two solar masses, there, thereabouts. If the biggest neutron star that we can build, the neutron star is sort of, that has the source of the, of the mass for, the, for, for a newly formed black hole. If the biggest neut neutron star that we can build, or sorry, that, that exists is around two solar masses, then it means that when black holes are, are born, they can be at most around two solar masses, right? But now when, when, the, when LIGO and Virgo, when the gravitational wave detectors, when they look at the signals that they're getting from black holes, they see lots of signals with 10 or 20 solar masses. And so there a big mystery is, well, okay, how do you form the 10s and the 20s, right? We know how to form the 2s, but how do you form the 10s and the 20s? Another thing that we don't know is if I have a sufficiently extreme, so that a singularity will form, Will that singularity always be trapped inside a black hole or not? To really understand that, we need to understand like the most extreme types of space times that you could imagine. We need to understand sort of the solution space of Einstein's theory of general relativity to understand, okay, if there's a singularity, will that singularity always be inside a, inside a black hole? There are people working in solve the field equations using approximation methods, like say perturbation theory or by taking the Newtonian theory and then fixing it up. That's called post-Newtonian. And then on the other hand, we also have, so, so there's kind of high performance computing there as well, because you need to write big codes to, to solve the equations that we need to solve. There are also, a, there's, there's a huge amount of work being done in astrophysical black holes for, for gravitational wave astronomy. Right? It's like there's a, there's a whole new type of astronomy which started, you know, in the last 10 years or so, right, that it actually really started to detect signals and see, see objects and do astrophysics with it. So um, I think it, it would be wrong to say, oh, you know, the research in, 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 on black holes is mostly mathematical or mostly numerical or mostly astrophysical. All of those things play, play a big role and, th and also theoretical physics plays a big role in that.